Um, our guest speaker for today is Ustad Saleh Basir. Um, just a little um, background on him, Ustad Saleh Basir is uh, currently completing his MA in Middle Eastern Studies at the University of Chicago while also studying at Dar al Qasim. He holds a BA in Middle Eastern Studies from Columbia University and an Alamiya degree from Dar al Uloom Azadville in, in South Africa. His interests include Ottoman and Mughal history. So we're really excited to have him here and have the, cover this topic today, inshallah. So Stad Saleh, you can take it away. Thank you so much, Sister Husna. Um, thank you everyone for joining. Really humbled and honored to be here. Um, you know, nobody can ever do justice to Muhammad Akbal, Rahimahullah, Attarallahu Qabra. Um, but uh, we'll go ahead and start, inshallah. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim Allahumma salli ala sayyidina wa sanadina wa rasulina wa habibina wa mahbubina Muhammad wa ala alihi alladhina qamu bi nusrat ad-din al-qawim wa ala sahbihi alladhina hum awu bi rasuli al-kareem So um I don't know who was there uh when I did uh the kind of end of uh or the beginning of the Mughal and the Ottoman empires um I think a month or two months ago but um and fortunately, and fortunately, in order to, to start with Iqbal, we're going to have to get a, a sense of the socio-historical um, uh, order of India during that time. Because remember, this is just British India. Um, Pakistan and Bangladesh have not yet come into existence. And um, then British India spans from what is present-day Peshawar to all the way um, what is present-day, uh, you know, Dhaka, Chiragong, Salat, etc., and um, so I'm going to go ahead and start the presentation. If you guys um, can, uh, if you guys have any problem seeing it, just go ahead and let me know. Um, but yeah, we'll go ahead and start. So um, this is the kind of um, this is a really interesting picture of Iqbal. Actually, um, he's uh, he was honored at Aligarh Muslim University um, as a kind of convocation speaker um, in the thing that we have today. And um, can everybody see it? I just want to make sure that everybody can see it. Okay. Um, okay. Um, on the on the top right hand side um, are actually his writings in Persian, and um, um, like his actual own handwriting that were preserved um, in a journal. Um, and then we'll talk about that more later. Um, the title I tend to strike the caravan bell. We'll talk about more about that later. But the caravan bell is this kind of Persian literary trope that he's going to use about kind of um, ensuring that Muslims are. Uh, wait. Hold up. I'm not. I think it's, I think because of the live, maybe it's uh, going a little bit, so maybe we'll just do this instead. But um, okay, so we'll go ahead and start here. So about 150 years before Iqbal is born, um, the Mughal Empire, we spoke about last time, the kind of last Muslim dynasty to rule South Asia. This is their extent, all of that that's ingrained, this is their empire, right? So um, you can see it's a pretty hefty chunk of South Asia. It's pretty much covers most of all of present day Afghanistan. Pakistan, Kashmir, India, Bangladesh, and parts of Tibet, um, with the exception of just the small tip near the end, right? So the Mughals had kind of really extended their control across the sweep of South Asia. Um, you know, you, you guys might remember Babur. He was the founder of the Mughal dynasty. Um, he was a Turk, a Turkic Hanafi who kind of came down from Central Asia and um, uh, started the dynasty of the Mughals. So this was their empire in the 1700s. Now, 60 years later, this is the Mughal Empire. It's no longer, it's essentially no longer there. So this is simply just 60 years after, so these are the Marathas, the East India Trading Companies, the British are already here within 60 years, have already carved out all of Bengal. Um, the Sikhs had taken over Punjab and Kashmir. And that's really, really important because we're gonna come back to Kashmir later. And, um, Kashmir is really where it starts for Iqbal and um, because we're going to talk about the idea of migrations and um, so we'll kind of talk about more of that later and, um, and, and
sorry, I'm not, am I, can you guys hear me? Yeah, hold on, we can hear you now. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure what happened, but okay, I'll go ahead and start sharing again. So um, again, coming back, right? So it's, it's, it's a really intense time. The Mughals lose their first um, territory to the British. So you can see the British vice regent here, his name's Lord Clive, Robert Clive. He, um, so, and the British by that, at that time are not invading as a country, but rather they're invading in the form of a capitalist corporation known as the East India Trading Company. So stockbrokers, investors, these are the people running, you know, large parts of India. And, um, and uh, essentially, um, in this treaty, the Mughals lose their first province, but within the next 30 years, the British are able to kind of capitalize on this and sweep across India, right? And um, it, it kind of culminates in um, this right here. So this is the last Mughal king, Bahadur Shah Zafar, um, a descendant of Babur, direct descendant, you know, 20 generations down. Um, they kind of end up having a rebellion against the British in 1857. This is about 20, 30 years before Alam Iqbal was born. And um, in this, uh, uh, um, this rebellion fails. And because the Mughal king still holds tremendous political and social capital across the sweep of India, the British decide not to kill him, but to exile him to Burma, present day Myanmar. And um, this is an actual photograph taken of him in the, 18, in the 1860s, 1870s, about 10 years before Iqbal was born. So this is the last Mughal king. And this is him in his exile, his final illness in Burma, the direct descendant of Babur. Um, I don't show you another, another, this is a kind of uh, a miniature that was painted in the 18th century of all the Mughal kings, starting with Timur, um, all the way down. Um, these are all different Mughal kings. Um, uh, and uh, this is the, all of their direct descendant right here, kind of dies by himself um, without his wife. With his children are kind of murdered in front of him to end the Mughal line because that poses a threat to the British. So this is 20, 30 years right before Iqbal's birth. So the last Muslim king of India kind of dies alone by himself in a British kind of apartment um, in Burma. And his grave is still present today um, in Burma. And you can visit it um, in Rangoon. And um, a famous couplet, I'm not sure if anyone has heard of it, but, you know, Bahadur Shah says to himself, you know, Kitna bad nasib hai zafar, ke kuhe do gaz zameen bhi na mile kuhe yaar mein. That how unfortunate is zafar, right? Meaning himself, um, self-referentially, that he couldn't even get two, year, two yards of burial in where his own family was buried, i.e. his wife, his, ch his children, his parents, etc. I mean, you know, these were his ancestors, this was his ancestor's kingdom, and this is how he died, right? And so you can, you can, you can, and, 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 I'm, and I'm trying to impart to you the sense of shock, right, that Muslims are now feeling um, after seeing their king kind of being led away like this. 900 years of, of approximately of Muslim rule within India, right? So, um, and that comes to an end by the hands of the British. And um, essentially, Muslims are in a crisis now because, um, and it's very different for Sikhs and the Hindus and the Buddhists and the Jains because they had never, they had not ruled India. Um, the Hindus and, you know, the Sikhs and the Buddhists and Jains had never ruled India. Um, I think the Buddhists maybe for one dynasty and the Hindus had obviously ruled before the Muslims. But for the past 900 years, it had only been Muslims, right? With small petty Hindu kingdoms dotted throughout the um, peninsula. And um, so for Muslims, you know, who are a minority, Right? So even though they had ruled for 900 years, I mean, really, the, you know, the biggest testament to Muslim tolerance under their rule is the fact that, you know, 70% of India or even 80% is still non-Muslim after 900 years of Muslim rule, right? You think about European rule of some of these Latin American or, you know, East, you know, Caribbean or East Asian countries, those countries are 100% Christian. How is that possible? 900 years of Muslim rule and only about 20, 30% Muslim, right? Um, um, this is another picture of Bahadur Shah Zafar, the last Mughal king. These are his two sons. Um, this is a British Lord Regent. Um, but yeah, and um, I mean, this itself is a reflection of what, um, you know, I think about the verse that Allah says in the Quran, right? قُلِ اللَّهُمَّ مَالِكَ الْمُلْكِ تُؤْتِ الْمُلْكَ مَنْ تَشَاءُ right? تُعَزُّ مَنْ تَشَاءُ وَتُذِلُّ مَنْ تَشَاءُ Say it as Allah who takes kingdoms, who gives kingdoms and, you know, takes it away, who, who gives glory and he snatches it away, right? And you know, putting this together was pretty emotional. You know, I, I study Mughal history, but it's, as an Indian Pakistani Muslim, it's, you know, it's really emotional to see this, you know, in just 60 years, the way that Allah kind of reduced them.
you know, uh, the Mughals were, you know, a hard reality for Muslims across South Asia for three, 400 years. And within 20 years, that reality just um, vanishes, right? You know, I mean, America has only been around for 200, what, 30, you know, 40, 50 years. And, um, you know, uh, you know, imagine if you were to wake up and England is no longer there, right? What would that, you know, what would that even mean? And so, and so you can think about what that means now for a population that is, you know, religiously stratified, I, you know, I would argue the most religiously, you know, diverse, um, you know, region in the world, right? How, you know, every religion can be found in the Indian subcontinent. And um, of course there are Muslims, but they are no longer the major majority. But um, anyway, so this is all in the background, right? And 20 years after this, Iqbal is born. These are Iqbal's parents. Um, uh, uh, he, uh, these are kind of uh, Kashmiris who had been exiled down to the south. Um, we talk a little bit about that. So after the Mughals lose territories, um, the Sikhs take control of Kashmir, Banjit Singh. Um, and uh, you can't really see Kashmir here, but um, it's kind of around here. And what, what essentially happens is that um, the Sikhs um, start to heavily tax Kashmiris. Um, and um, at that time, Kashmir is really more a peasant based and agrarian society. And because of these high taxes, um, Muslims in Kashmir start to flee down into Punjab, right? So this happens in the 19th century, right? So you have thousands of these Muslim Kashmiris, and you can really call this the first exile of Kashmiri Muslims who have to kind of come down into the plateau of Punjab because of these exorbitant tax rates and also the Jami Masjid of Srinagar um, is closed down, Azan is forbidden um, in certain regions of Kashmir. Um, this is, you know, all early 1800s under the Sikh rule, and then the British kind of take over um, and things start to relax, and then it's now given to the Maharaja, whom, and then you guys know the rest of the story. But um, so Iqbal's ancestors are Kashmiri, I would say third generation. Iqbal's grandfather or great grandfather had fled Kashmir um, down to a town called Sialkot, which is located today in Pakistani Punjab um, near Lahore. And um, he did not come from a wealthy family. As I said, his ancestors were these kind of um, Hindu Brahmins who had converted to Islam and um, farmers not, you know, not really noteworthy. His father was a tailor. So for hijabs and niqabs for women, he would kind of, um, you know, he, he'd create the fabric for that. So not wealthy by any measure. Iqbal went to um, a local madrasa, a local maktab, um, didn't really have funds to go to an English missionary school um, in as much as the wealthy Muslims and wealthy Hindus um, were sending their kids, right? They wanted them now to have an elite British, English, you know, secular education. His father, Sheikh Muhammad Iqbal, or Sheikh Iqbal, or Haji Noor Iqbal, rather, um, could not afford an English education, and therefore sent him to a madrasa. This is where Iqbal would first come into contact with Arabic and Persian. Um, and, uh, oh man, we're already at 20 minutes. But um, we, this is really important because the dominant portion of Iqbal's work will be in Persian. And um, Persian had served as the language of Muslims of India for about 800 years. And um, essentially what happens in 1832, and, and I, I mention all of this because this is all intertwined, right? Like you can't talk about Iqbal without talking about the history of Persian in India. You can't talk about Iqbal without talking about the Mughals in India. You can't talk about Iqbal without talking about the economic, um, the, the low, socio the low socioeconomic fortunes of South Asian Muslims in the 20th century, and you can't talk about Iqbal without talking about the British. So all of these things are inter intertwined, and that's why he's, he himself comes out such a rich and um, you know, intellectually rich and such a complicated figure because of all these different factors that inform his life, right? Because of all of these different um, literary, historical, and social factors that, that affect both his family and, and his own academic career um, really creates the, the, the personality of Iqbal. Um, and so Iqbal, um, and, and, and so which is the reason why I do have to spend some time on this because we won't understand Iqbal if we don't understand his, his background, right? It would be like reading Shakespeare without understanding, you know, 16th century England. But, you know, 20th century India is vastly more complicated than 16th century England. Uh, but anyways, so Iqbal is born into this kind of poor, poor uh, Kashmiri Punjabi family. Um, and Iqbal later on, you know, especially in his Persian poetry, reflect fondly of his Kashmiri origins. He has this famous uh, Persian ghazal where he says, you know, Zathanam khayabane jannate Kashmir dilam az halame hijazat vanavam ashiraz that my body is from, you know, the, the paradise avenues of Kashmir and, and, and you know, the, the comparisons of jannat 
or of heaven in Kashmir start from the Mughal days, so 500 years before him. So he's drawing on that canon of poetry. So he says that my body is from the paradise avenues of Kashmir. My heart is from the Haram, meaning Mecca, and my song is from Iran, um, showing the, the, again, the rich and the multifaceted nature of Iqbal, that he himself is this Indian who is writing in Farsi, but his, but his intellectual language is Islamic. And, um, and you know, we'll, we'll talk more about that later. Um, but also that's just Mughal India, right? And we have to remember that this is now a globalized world. The steamship is there, the printing press is there. Um, newspapers are now being circulated globally. English, is now start, English and French have now started to become the dominant languages, replacing Arabic and Persian in the Muslim world. Um, and so, uh, but before I talk about that, Iqbal kind of, um, he goes to uh, um, England to uh, essentially become a lawyer. So he goes to Cambridge. He's one of the first Indians, and if I'm not mistaken, the first Indian Muslim to attend Cambridge. Um, you know, and he attends Cambridge in 1905 on the recommendation of a professor named Reynold Nicholson. Reynold Nicholson, by the way, is the first person who translates Rumi into English. And I would argue it's still the best translation of Rumi today, um, Reynold Nicholson. He was uh, Iqbal's professor um, in Lahore. And uh, he kind of advises Iqbal to go study in England. So Iqbal no, now goes and um, after majoring in Islamic and Arabic studies um, at the Lahore College, he travels to England. He goes to London um, specific, and then goes to Cambridge and studies for two to three years, writes a thesis. And his thesis is so phenomenal that he's kind of recommended to go pursue a PhD. So he kind of becomes a lawyer and then he goes and he earns his PhD in Germany and we've kind of forgotten this because of um, World War II, but Germany before World War II and World War I was a center of philosophy, right? So we can think about people like Kant, um, Nietzsche, um, Heidegger, um, all of these people um, are all German, right? So uh, this is really crucial. So, so, you know, in the same way that today you would go and, um, you know, you would study French, uh, you know, French literature at Stanford or Yale in the same way that, you know, you would only go, in, in, to, you know, uh, to study philosophy in Germany. Um, and, you know, otherwise, Iqbal could have easily stayed at Cambridge and, you know, earned his PhD, but, uh, you know, the most brilliant Western philosophers were in Germany. So he goes to a place called Heidelberg, right, and he um, kind of reworks his, dissert his undergrad thesis, his undergrad dissertation um, into the development of metaphysics of Persia and um, this is the kind of German copy of his dis dissertation. And he ends up learning German um, in the same way that today, uh, for people who are, you know, earning a PhD, have to study German and French, uh, even today. And uh, he writes his thesis on the development of metaphysics of Persia. Metaphysics just means it's a, it's a fancy word for philosophy, but more dealing with the supernatural. Um, and he's really interested in Iran, right? And um, that's, that's important because uh, South Asian Muslims um, are really heirs to this mixture of, you know, Turks, Arabs, Iranians, Afghans, as well as Native Indians, right? So it's really this metaphor for Islam. So South Asian Muslims, but um, really the most dominant civilization that had an impact on India was Iran, right? So Urdu, um, philosophy, literature, um, you know, even theology, all of that, all, um, all of that is really being um, influenced by Iran. Um, over the swath of eight, nine hundred years, right? I mean, Arabs have, you know, at best a minimal influence on how South Asian Islam uh, is practiced other than these kind of small networks of Arab traders coming in mostly from Yemen and Iraq. And anyways, he, 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 he kind of writes his dissertation on Iran. He's trying to trace how um, Iranian philosophy um, is something a little bit different. And um, if I can kind of pull this up, um, for Iqbal, um, he says he, he makes this really interesting comment about how the most uh, the most significant let me just pull this up. he says he says the most significant battle or the sorry the most significant event um, in the history of Islam is this event right here called the Battle of Nahavand. This is when the Sahaba, the Prophet Ali's companions, take Iran. It's the final battle where the Sahaba take Iran, and the reason why he says this um, is because. Uh, essentially, he, he says this. Iqbal says, if you ask me what is the most important event in the history of Islam, and, and I mention this because this dominates the rest of his thought, okay? So Iqbal says, if you ask me what is the most important event in the history of Islam, I shall say without any hesitation the conquest of Persia. 
The Battle of Nahavand gave the Arabs not only a beautiful country, but also an ancient civilization, or more properly, a people who could make a new civilization with the Semitic and Aryan material, i.e. their intellectual history. Our Muslim civilization is a product of the cross-fertilization of the Semitic and the Aryan ideas, i.e. the Arab and the Iranian. It is a child who inherits the softness and refinement of his Aryan mother and the sterling character of his Semitic father. But for the conquest of Persia, the civilization of Islam would have been one-sided, i.e. if Muslims had never taken Iran. The conquest of Persia gave us what the conquest of Greece gave to the Romans. All right, so you guys can kind of see how um, uh, Iqbal is really, uh, really, really taken aback and um, really um, uh, influenced by the legacy of Iran on Islam. And so, you know, when we think about literature, Mulan and Rumi and all of our, our greatest philosophers, Imam Ghazali, um, Ibn Sina, they're all Persian, right? Our greatest poets are Persian. Some of our greatest architects and miniature painters are all, you know, are all Persian. Right, and so Iqbal was very much aware of that. Um, and this is not this is not to say um, about Iranian supremacy um, in the way that you'll hear today of these kind of Ira LA Iranians that I you know went to high school with, and it's a very different kind of uh, thing. But this is an argument that kind of transcends nationalism, and we'll talk about Iqbal and nationalism if we have a part two, because that itself um, is its own topic. And so Iqbal again is kind of um, so he spends these three years right in in Europe and in, in Cambridge and then in Germany, um, and then he comes back to Lahore. Right, and um, he would he would write on these experiences in Europe and how he had been kind of transformed by them, but not in a good way. Right, so he says, um, you know, there's this really interesting exchange with you know that happens with Iqbal and this wealthy Punjabi landowner, and you know, for those people who know that archetype, they're really you know 100 years ago and today it's still the same kind of entitled uh, sense. But um, anyways, this this Punjabi landowner asks Iqbal. Um, uh, you know, how was, how, how was Europe, right? And um, Iqbal, you know, he's like, he's like, what do you mean? He was like, oh, but like, you know, Europe, it has all these roads and it has, um, uh, it has, uh, you know, it has these street lamps, it has a certain sense of cars. And, um, you know, obviously compared to India, we don't have that same technology. And Iqbal just shoots back and he says, uh, an Urdu couplet where he says, khira na kar saka mujajal vaidan shayafrang that my eyes could never be charmed by the uh, by the lights of Europe or the progress of Europe that my eyes have been um, uh, have been stained by the dust of Medina and Najaf right and, and showing how the intellectual foundation of a Muslim should always still be quintessentially Muslim that even if you're kind of studying different ideas even if you're engaging with different traditions that whenever Islam, you know, encountered a different civilization, there was a clash of ideas. Sorry, is there? Um, you know, there's, you know, there was a clash of ideas, but um, th that clash was always creative, right? It produced a new legacy. When Imam Ghazali en encountered the philosophers, these kind of atheistic philosophers, with, you know, with the Greeks, and then he responds and he studies this philosophy. It just creates a much more intellectual, solid grounding of Islam because Imam Ghazali never compromises on the essentials, right? Tawheed, Risala, um, oneness of Allah, the Prophet, you know, the fact that the Holy Prophet is the last and final messenger, alayhi salawatu wasalam, right? And, um, so, so, and so all of these essential tenets of Islam can never be compromised, right? There's a certain ethical and moral spirit to the Sharia. Right. And so and so or, you know, the Quran being the, you know, you know, the book of Allah, et cetera, et cetera. And um, for Iqbal, that's really important. And um, and so for him, what he sees going on is that a lot of these 20th century Muslims under the guise of uh, of, uh, of of, you know, cross cultural exchange or, you know, intellectual borrowing. He says that um, he you know, he says that uh, these Muslims are kind of just copy and pasting what Europe is doing. Right, and so for Iqbal, you know, copy pasting what Europe is, you know, it's all about intellectual exchange. But when you're just copy and pasting from another civilization into your civilization, that's not, you know, that's not intellectual exchange. That's not, that's not um, borrowing or or this kind of creative borrowing. You know, you're just being, uh, you know, uh, you know, you're at best just a second or third rate intellectual because you're just borrowing, right? And so today, you know, when you talk about Islamic psychology or Islamic sciences. Um, Islamic psychology, you know, if you see some of these articles, you know, that's not Islamic. That's just Western psychology with Islamic terminology. That's not Islam. Islam is, you know, it, you know, is this, you know, vertical and horizontal civilization. And Iqbal will talk about that uh, more in his philosophy, you know. Um, 
but uh, talking about Iqbal, I'm just gonna show you guys some of his pictures really quick. Um, that there's a kind of collection. If you guys can see, um, this is a picture, this is right here, Iqbal in Germany, when he's earning his PhD, because of some of the other Indian students, I'm not sure if they were Muslim, um, uh, because again, India is just India, uh, what includes today ba Pakistan and Bangladesh and Kashmir. And, um, and so this is Iqbal in Germany. Um, this is Iqbal um, in Simla, which is kind of, and, and he becomes a politician. Um, this is Iqbal in a Sikh conference, right? He's trying to kind of understand the Sikh demand for a separate state um, and how that, and, and because Sikhs are very much just happy or unhappy with Pakistan coming into being because it's taking away half of Punjab. Um, but we can talk about partition later. Again, um, Iqbal is wearing this, what's known as a Rumi topi. Rumi, it's coming from the Ottomans. Um, they're trying to kind of cultivate these pan-Muslim bonds. So Turkey and South Asian Muslims, um, those connections actually extend a previous century. Um, wealthy Muslims, especially from Lahore, uh, Delhi, Madras, Hyderabad, and parts of Kashmir, um, begin to send large amounts of money to um, Ottoman, um, uh, to you know, you know, to the Ottoman war relief effort during World War One. And we'll talk about more about that later. Um, this is Iqbal in South India. Iqbal, he kind of comes. This is him right here. Uh, this is Iqbal with other leading Indian Muslims. But um, this is Iqbal in Palestine in Jerusalem. That's the Grand Mufti of Palestine. He's kind of part of, you know, much, uh, you know, much larger international kind of um, uh, concerns with Muslims. This is Iqbal in Afghanistan. Iqbal was kind of, uh, he's right here. Iqbal was invited to kind of start the first Islamic university um, and to lay the plans for that. Unfortunately, it never came into fruition because of the Soviets when they invaded in 1979, about 30 years after this picture. This is Iqbal in Spain. Um, he's really the first Muslim that I know that prays in the mosque of Cordoba after Muslims were kicked out 500 years later, etc. But um, yeah, so just to kind of have that image in your head. But um, going back, so Iqbal kind of comes back to... Um, to uh, India, to Lahore, and um, this is the state of the Ottomans, and this is really, really important, um, especially because now this will involve Gandhi and what's known as the Khilafat movement. Um, but essentially, the Ottoman Empire, what we see in red, um, the Ottomans lose what we see in orange in the span of about 10, 15 years, right? Bulgaria, the Balkans, all of North Africa, and um, essentially, Iqbal, um, and as well as most Indian Muslims now feel that the Ottomans being, the, remember, they're the last Muslim empire. The Iranians have, you know, canceled their empire. I don't want to use that term. The Mughals are obviously gone. So every single Muslim area has essentially been colonized with the exception of Afghanistan and the Ottomans, right? And so now the Ottomans are rapidly losing territory, right? They're, you know, they lose about 30% of their empire, you know, in 1908. Um, you know, with the war with the Russians and then, and then with, the, with, the, with the Austrians. And then they lose North Africa. Italy invades North Africa and then British, you know, the British take the Egypt. So you can feel the sense of dislocation and the, you know, the sense of insecurity and anxiety a Muslim feels, right? Especially when you're in India, when you've already been under the occupation of the British for about a hundred years, right? And so that idea of, you know, seeing the Ottomans as the last defenders of Islamic civilization, of Islamic honor, of Islamic glory, right? Because remember, before the Europeans, the only dominant civilization for the past 1,200 years had been the Muslims, with the exception of the Mongols for about 100 years, but they never really had a civilization, they just conquered areas. Um, whereas the Muslims, remember, they not only produced um, a religious civilization, but it was theological, it was legal, it was architectural, it was literary, it was poetic. I mean, Muslims are, you know, are no longer poets. Um, and, you know, we'll talk about more about this later, but that, you know, the fact that the, a poet held such a central role and such an important role in society. Um, and even the way that we talk in Urdu, right? We say, right? A uh, calamity has afflicted us. You know, you know, Muslims say that in their day, in their everyday speech in South Asia. Nobody says that in English, that, oh my God, I was just hit by a calamity. Right? That's just like not, you know, we'll just say like something bad is going on, you know, and taking care of something. But um, that language is, is preserved today in Urdu because Urdu is kind of emerging out of this very literary, um, high um, elite kind of class of, of, of language. Um, and, and those themes are kind of then um, assimilated into the everyday speech of Muslims within South Asia. Um, that's also present, by the way, in Turkey. Um, and, uh, you know, when I was studying Turkish, uh, 
a lot of these uh, kind of Persian and Arabic uh, constructions are, are, are present in the everyday language of Turks, um, but that's a separate occasion. So anyways, Iqbal um, kind of comes back, right? And so now he's a lawyer, right? Um, he uh, is a theologian, he's a, he's a philosopher, and he's a statesman. He gets elected to the kind of Punjabi legislative assembly, right? So he's now fulfilling all of these four or five roles and, uh, you know, kind of showcasing. And he has not yet published any poetry. And um, okay, uh, yeah. So um, we, uh, unfortunately, we don't have much time left and I'll, I'll try to do as much as I can. Um, but yeah, I mean, as I said, Iqbal is not someone that can be captured in an hour, um, you know. Uh, but yeah, so anyways, Iqbal, he, uh, he kind of, um, you know, is deeply concerned about the state of Muslims and especially the state of the Ottomans, um, as I said, being the last frontier against European aggression, right? As I said, every other single Muslim majority region, you know, as far as Indonesia, right? Indonesia, you know, Indonesia is under the Dutch, right? And so, you know, Morocco is under the French. And so, you know, as far as the eye can see, as far as the map can extend, Muslims are under European aggression, except for the Ottomans, right? And, you know, in this orange area, so and it's what is present-day Turkey, Syria, Palestine, Lebanon, Jordan, and Saudi Arabia, and Iraq. Um, and so the Ottomans um, uh, are kind of um, in this really uh, pitiable state where, you know, they have multiple, you know, they have enemies on all sides. Iran is not a big fan of the Ottomans. The Europeans are there. The Greeks are there. The Russians are there. Everyone kind of wants to take a size or a bite out of, you know, the Ottoman Empire. And so in 1912, I believe, in Lahore, what's known as the Anjumani Himayate Islami, or the Assembly for the uh, Defense of Islam. And this was a literary organization kind of composed of elite um, Indian Muslims in Punjab, you know, mostly Punjabis and Kashmiris. And uh, this was a literary assembly and Iqbal starts to write poetry, right? And um, he kind of bursts onto the scene with this poem where he calls the shikwa. And um, we'll talk a little bit about his Urdu poetry today, um, but I really want to talk about his Persian because I think um, most of Iqbal is contained in his Persian. So Iqbal has written about 12,000 lines of poetry, right? And this is only, you know, this is only 70, 80 years ago. And he wrote in Urdu and Persian. And then, you know, he has, you know, hundreds of pages of, you know, English philosophical writings, right? So this is a man, you know, who has written, you know, who straddles, you know, e Urdu, Persian, and English, right? And we know that he spoke Arabic, Urdu, Persian, Punjabi, um, you know, probably, you know, some, some Kashmiri because of his grandparents, and English and German, right? And so when we think about, um, you know, what this one person achieved, you know, the son of a tailor, you know, a poor kind of Kashmiri descended son of a tailor, um, and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala kind of, you know, can bring one person up depending on what they uh, want in this world is really astounding to me. And, you know, I just... I, as, as, as someone who has spent a lot of time studying Iqbal, I still am I'm floored by just, uh, you know, his prose and some of his ideas. Um, and, you know, we can, we can talk more about that later. But anyways, in 1912, after the Ottomans lose the Balkans, so what is present day Bosnia, Serbia, Albania, Montenegro, they lose all of those countries. And Iqbal writes a poem called the Shikwa. And uh, this is probably his most famous poem. I, want, I do want to read some of his lines. And shikwa in Arabic means to complain. Um, it comes in the Quran, um, in, in the story of Yusuf, on the fifth page of the 13th Jews when Allah is quoting Ya'qub alayhi salam. So Ya'qub alayhi salam, Yusuf alayhi salam, right, is kind of exiled from his family. And Ya'qub alayhi salam, reflecting on his son, he says, قَالَ إِنَّمَا أَشْكُوا بَثِّي وَحُزْنِي إِلَى اللَّهِ وَأَعْلَمُ مِنَ اللَّهِ مَا لَا تَعْلَمُونَ so Sayyidina Ya'qub tells us, أَشْكُو, I complain to Allah, right? About my pain and my sorrow to Allah. So there was a genre of kind of complaining that was contained. And then later on, um, after the Muslims are exiled from Spain, they, uh, they, um, they, they will also write the genre of poetry as well as in Shi'i poetry. And you'll see this performed in certain cities um, like in Ladakh and Kashmir and um, in, in Lucknow and Karachi. The Marsiya, which is the kind of mourning of Sayyidina Hussein after he was martyred, radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Um, and, and so Iqbal kind of taps into the genre, right? Uh, but also the genre itself of mourning, but is also interlaced with these kind of Persian literary symbols, 
And um, so the idea of the garden, the rose, the nightingale, uh, the perfu you know, the, the perfume of the garden, roses, thorns, Layla and Majnoon, you know, Majnoon call, you know, calling out in the desert, howling in the desert for Layla, you know, not being able to obtain um, the love of Layla, um, you know, and being constantly kind of dismissed, um, uh, or his affections being dismissed by Layla, etc. So all of these themes are kind of contained in Persian. And then because Urdu is a direct daughter of Persian, um, also inherits a lot of those symbols. Right. And um, so I'll read some of these lines. And so Iqbal, um, and this is what really starts his poetic career where he kind of shifts, uh, you know, from being a lawyer, a statesman and a philosopher, and then comes uh, and, and um, as a poet. Yeah, um, just the way Ron said, exactly. If you guys have any questions, you guys can go ahead and start sending them, them now and we'll discuss them later, right? And, and so remember, and, and, and keep in mind what I, what I discussed earlier about the, the end of the Mughals. Right, the fact that the Mughals are have uh, you know have ended. Indian Muslims no longer feel a sense of dignity after ruling for 900 years. They've lost their place in society. Persian has now been dislocated. People no really longer people no longer really speak Persian, um, you know, and also just a sense of Muslim uh, uh, kind of um, uh, rupture and dislocation and um, uh, sense of loss. Really, uh, is the best way to explain it. So he says. And I'll just read, you know, some of these lines, um, really detailing his complaint to Allah, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala about why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is punishing the Muslims, um, why Muslims have lost their sense of grandeur and stature in the world, you know, why are, are they poor, why are they in poverty, why, you know, has the West dominated them, right? And so it's really this private exchange between um, a, a Muslim and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so he says, you know, speaking to, directly to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that hey baja shi vaye tasneem mein mashhoor hai hum qissa-e dard sunate hai ki majboor hai hum that oh Allah, we Muslims have been known for submitting to you we are famous for submitting to you but now, oh Allah, we're forced to narrate a story of pain to you saaz-e khamosh hai fariyahat se ma'mur hai hum our musical instruments are silent but inside we're, we're filled with complaints that we're bursting with complaints from inside that, oh Allah, na la ta hai agar lab pe to ma'zoor hai hum. That, oh Allah, if any offensive remark comes on our lips, then, oh Allah, we are excused. Bas rahe tahi yahi saljuk bhi turani bhi ahle chin chin mein iran mein saasani bhi isi, isi dunya mein abad the yunani bhi isi dunya mein yahudi bhi the nasrani bhi. Right? That, oh Allah, in this world, there were the Turks, there were, there, you know, there were the Iranians, there were the Chinese, there were the Greeks, there were the Christians. But oh Allah, who lifted, um, who lifted your name, right? Who kind of mentioned your name? Who, who brought to life the mentioning of your name? The azani kabi yurab ke kalisao me, kabi Afrika ke tapte hui sahrao me. But oh Allah, how far did we go? Meaning the Muslims, how far did we go to spread your message? Right? We we gave azan in the churches of Europe and we spread your message across the you know the deserts of the Sahara. Kisne thanda kia atish qadai iranku. You know, the Zoroastrian fire that was burning in the, in, you know, in the temples of Iran, who finally, you know, uh, extinguished that fire. And, you know, we don't have the time, but I mean, there's so much to, to, to kind of unpack here in terms of the literary tropes and, you know, the way he's drawing on Rumi and Attar and Ghalib. And it's, you know, it's, uh, you know, if, uh, you know, for our grandparents, uh, what, this is why this poem is so important, um, because he's speaking to an audience that is familiar with these themes. Right, um, and then um, this is really the kind of um, uh, the, the the climax of the poem, and he gets a lot of flack for this, but he kind of tells Allah that um, you know, Pirbi sabhai dhar se baatil ko mithaya hamne no insan ko gulami se churaya hamne tere kabe ko jabino se basaya hamne tere Quran sino se lagaya hamne Pirbi ham se ye gila hai ki ham mafadar nahi ham mafadar nahi tu bhi to dildar hi nahi. That, oh Allah, that, you know, from the pages of history, we removed falsehood, we emancipated human beings from slavery, and oh Allah, we put the Qur'ans to our chest, and oh Allah, we put our hands, uh, our, our foreheads, in, in, you know, in front of the Kaaba, and then he says this line that's, you know, considered somewhat um, uh, 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 disrespectful, but he says, oh Allah, phir bhi hum se gila hai ka hum mafadar nahi, but oh Allah, this complaint, oh Allah, still comes from you, that we Muslims are disloyal. 
ham wafadar nahi. Oh Allah, if we're disloyal despite all of this stuff, right? Right before that, he says, "Ah gaya aina larai me agar vakt e namaz qibla ruho ke zameen boz huye qoum hijaz." ایک ہی صف میں کھڑے ہو گئے محمود آیاز نہ کوئی بندہ رہا اور نہ کوئی بندہ نواز that in the midst of battle if the time of namaz of prayer of salah came then we alighted from our horses like the friends of the prophet and we turned towards مکہ in that battle we became like محمود and آیاز محمود and آیاز were this kind of famous king and slave um, that had a really interesting um, kind of uh, the Sufi fear relationship and he said like a king and a slave we stood as one no longer um, we stood as a prince or no longer did we stand um, as, as a poor person, right? And then he says that, oh Allah, if we're disloyal, then Allah, we have to say that you no longer have mercy for us, right? And this was considered a kind of blasphemous um, way of speaking to Allah. But this is really only for people who don't understand Islamic poetry. Um, this is actually really common. Um, if you, so if you, there's a kind of Persian literary principle that says, Bakhuda divana bash ba Muhammad hoshiyat that essentially when you write about Allah, you can kind of speak in ecstasy, say whatever you want, what you want about God, because God is your lover, right? So Mulan Rumi will compare Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to Layla, right? As Layla being the kind of embodiment of love and um, of desire and of, of aspiration. And Mulan Rumi will compare Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the kind of black hair of Layla uh, uh, as she's poet, uh, po po poetized by Majnoon or Qais from Najd. But this Persian kind of principle says that say what you want about Allah, but Muhammad Hoshad, but watch your tongue when it comes to the Prophet. I don't say weird stuff when it comes to the Prophet, but you can. Um, that permission is granted when it comes to Allah because um, he is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but Allah himself has protected the honor of the Holy Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam, and which is why even in you know some of the craziest, you know, these alcoholic poets of the past, um, you know, you know, the they'll say sometimes really strange stuff, but all of them will always watch their tongue and speak very respectfully when it comes to the exalted Prophet alayhi um, salatu And then, the, you know, the, the, the poem goes on to this climax where it's kind of um, addressing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and taking issue with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then it kind of descends and register and then he says, But salam khanu me kehdehe ke musalman gay hey khushi unku kikabe ke nigeh ban gay Right, the idol assemblies are howling with laughter that look, Muslims are leaving. How happy they are to see the custodians of the Kaaba leave their sanctuary. Right, so we kind of the sense of uh, feeling humiliated, feeling despised, um, uh, feeling, you know, the, the sense of exile, you know, the idea that you're powerless, the idea that you no longer have even control of your own course of destiny. Um, and so um, I, I'm obviously not doing justice to the to the thunder of Iqbal's thought or his words, but um, imagine being there, right? In 1912, you're a South Asian Muslim, you're living under the British, and you're hearing these words, right? And nobody's, nobody has written like this before, even though South Asian, you know, nobody has produced as many poets as South Asia has, right? There are more, there are more, there is more Persian literature from, it, for, from what is today India and Pakistan than there is from Iran and Afghanistan, right? And many academics have, have written about this, namely my professors like Muzaffar Alam at the University of Chicago, and and um, uh, Anne, Anne Mary Schimmel, who was the, the kind of Persian professor at Harvard um, from the 70s to the 90s. But um, so you can kind of uh, understand um, what this meant to the South Asian Muslims and why it became so popular, why it kind of spread like wildfire across literary Muslim circles. You know, and then he kind of ends with these couple of lines where he says, you know, hum to rukhsat huwe oro ne sambhali dunya that oh Allah, we've left, other people have come. That oh Allah, you know, since you are in control of everything, don't blame us if Tawheed no longer remains in this world. And then Iqbal now is just kind of inquisitive. He says, this is all the same poem, remember. You know, that that the, the pain of Layla is still there, you know, that yearning of Layla is still there. And so he's trying to create this metaphor of the Ummah as Layla, um, or sorry, as Majnoon and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala again. As Layla, Qais, Qais is Majnoon, that's his, that was his actual name. Majnoon just means insane, and that was the title given to him because he had become so insane for the affections of Layla. Um, you know, and then he says, almost weeping, right? You can feel Iqbal weeping um, in these lines of poetry, right? What does it mean to exist as a Muslim in 1912? 
تیری محفل بھی گئی چاہنے والے بھی گئی شب کے آہیں بھی گئی صبح کے نالے بھی گئی that oh Allah, the mahfil, um, it's an Arabic word. Today, if you say hafla in modern Arabic, it means like a party or a celebration. But in, but in Urdu and Persian, mahfil specifically meant a literary or a poetic assembly, right? So, oh Allah, teri mahfil bihi gay, right? You're, and you're typically referred to the Mughal court, the Mughal emperor and their kind of elite leaders would have um, these, these mushairas or these poetic assemblies, right? So he says that the, these poets, you know, i.e. making a metaphor of the Muslim Ummah, oh Allah, they've left, all those people who have desire, oh Allah, they've left too, oh Allah, that, uh, that sigh of night, right, we say, right, we say, right, that, that sigh of night, or that morning of night has departed, or the lament of the morning has also departed, Right? And then he has this other line where he says that all the singers have left, but there's still one nightingale, one bulbul left in the garden, referring to himself. Um, and then he ends the poem with this brilliant, brilliant couplet where he says, that He says that, so what if my wine, um, or so what if my goblet is, is Persian? My goblet is, is, is Hijazi. Hijaz is specifically the region where Mecca and Medina is. So you can say that, you know, so what if my goblet, you know, is Persian? My, gob, uh, my wine is still prophetic or it's still Mecca, i.e. that my intellectual legacy is still very much rooted in Islam, even if, you know, the form is Persian and Mughal. And then he says, Hindi hey So what if this is a Persian song? to Hijazi hey Meri that my, my meter or my rhythm still comes from the Prophet, you know, and he ends with this poem. And um, you can imagine the audience and the whore and the Muslims, how they felt after the end of this poem, right? And uh, he, uh, so this is just called the Shikwa, and uh, he essentially goes on later to write the Jawab Shikwa, which is a response from the pen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, I think we have uh, some time. I don't know if you guys want to focus more on his poetry or philosophy, but I guess we could do um, uh, more poetry next time. But um, I would say, so he ends up coming up with his first collection of poetry called Asrar Khudi um, a, a couple of years before that. Uh, and um, this is a Persian kind of Masnavi. So we know the Masnavi of Rumi, right? That's his kind of most famous, I think, six volumes that Rumi wrote. And Iqbal kind of imitated the meter but also in Persian. And in, you know, in the introduction, he has this really uh, elegant and self-reflective line where he says that, Agarche Urdu shakkar, you know, Agarche Urdu shakkar ast, that is a shirin taras. Right, that um, even if um, Urdu is sweet, that I still find Persian to be a lot, uh, yeah, so even if Urdu is sweet, I still find Persian to be a lot sweeter. And, um, and uh, it's, uh, kind of tying back or indicating to why Iqbal chose to, wrote, to write in Persian, right? So he has 12,000 lines of poetry, 7,000 of which are in Persian, and 5,000 are in Urdu. Um, I've dug around for the past couple of years, and essentially Iqbal, in a letter, wrote that he chose to write in Persian because he wanted his message, um, i.e. to reflect the kind of lost literary, the, the last literary heritage of South Asian Muslims, Indian, Pakistani. Um, obviously, Pakistan is not a, is not a nation then. And um, because it was the dominant language of Muslims in South Asia for so long, he kind of wanted it to be its kind of last gasp of air. And Iqbal is the last Persian poet of India, right? So after hundreds and thousands of Persian poets, you know, namely starting with Kashmiris and then Punjabis and then North Indians and South Indians and then Bengalis, um, all of these different poets who write in Persian, um, Iqbal is the last Persian, uh, is the last South Asian who writes in Persian. Um, and, uh, and, and it's, it's really unfortunate because his Persian poetry being the dominant corpus or the dominant portion of his corpus of work has been essentially neglected because nobody speaks Farsi anymore in Pakistan. Um, there's no real literary reconstruction going on in Afghanistan or Tajikistan, unfortunately. And Iran, um, they're incredibly nationalist. And even though there is some appreciation for Iqbal in Iran, but it's more on an academic level, there is really no widespread acceptance um, reading or, or reading of Iqbal in Iran. In some schools, they mandate reading of Iqbal in Iran, but it's not really widespread. So Iqbal's Persian has essentially just been erased. So 30, 40% of his own thought of his oeuvre has, you know, kind of been erased. And 
which is so unfortunate. I mean, you, you, you think about some of the stuff that he said, right? He has this poem where he says, that a Muslim was a king and a Sufi so high, but now the flame in his chest for the divine has burnt out. His heart often weeps, but he doesn't know why. A glance, a glance, O Prophet of Allah, a glance, O Prophet of Allah. Right? And um, uh, it's, it's um, so... Uh, it's so reflective of how Iqbal felt during that time, right? Or for example, Iqbal says, Musalman sharam sar az beigilahist tu dani kidar jahan tu rasi machis kalimi az kumashe badshahist, right? That Muslims are ashamed of losing their kingdom. Do you know what we have inherited? What what we have inherited after 1,200 years of ruling, right? 1,200 years of Islamic rule across the world from Spain to Indonesia, and he says a blanket made of silk to prove that we once you know had any honor or dignity in this world right and um you know for us today it's not we don't really feel that same sense of shock that iqbal felt or the average muslim felt 100 years ago but um without understanding that climate and that sense of loss and indignity and humiliation we won't understand iqbal at all and much of his couplets are kind of addressed to that and uh to that point we can kind of discuss next week um and, uh, you know, for uh, Iqbal, you know, he's straddling these different worlds, right? And um, as I said, he kind of completed Asrad al-Khudi, which is more of a critique of Greek philosophy. Um, and he's concerned about the intellectual foundations of Islam, right? Because remember, before him, we had Imam Ghazali, uh, as I said, who kind of took on the Western philosophers, you know, became a master of it, and then critiqued it, therefore kind of consolidating um, the, 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 the architecture of Islam, the building of Islam, right? And, uh, and, and every time, and, and it's so interesting is that every time a new fitna came, it seems that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala appointed someone who was able to kind of rise and then respond to it, there, therefore kind of adding an additional scaffolding to the intellectual architecture of Islam, right? And so just singularly by Imam Ghazali, Islam was able to kind of, you know, was able to, 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 to sail through all of the crises, you know, up until the Europeans, so about 700, you know, seven, 800 years, right? And so Iqbal kind of sees himself in this project of reconstruction, right? And this is why there's a huge difference between reformation and reconstruction, right? And for, and, and so, and so reformation, you know, in as much as the Europeans underwent, um, is very different than what Iqbal feels the Muslims need, right? And so Iqbal kind of does this, um, huge appraisal of the Islamic tradition, right, um, intellectually, literarily, um, philosophically, theologically, legally, jurisprudentially, and um, to really ascertain where Muslims um, need to be and where they can rise. And um, we don't have much time left. I'll just end with this. But his dominant kind of critique of, 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 uh, of, of the Muslim subject, right, of what the Muslim needs to be, and he outlays his vision of the khudi, or what's known as selfhood. So we know the word khud for the Urdu speakers means self, right? Khud jake, right? The, our, we go, ourselves go. And khudi is the abstract noun, right? Or selfhood. And khudi um, in Persian had originally meant, you know, had negative connotations, right? It was selfishness to be obsessed with yourself. But Iqbal does this really brilliant retooling of the word where he kind of lends the meaning of, you know, selfhood, right? Of individuality, of self-personality. Right, that Muslims now need to understand what it means to be Muslim intellectually and theologically, right? And you know, they can no longer just rely on what their local imam or their local malana tells them, right? Then there needs to be this kind of critical fashioning of what the Muslim, Muslim subjecthood is. And in some sense, he was kind of thankful um, for the West only because they now challenged Muslims, um, you know, in every single department. And Iqbal felt like this was an excellent opportunity for now Muslims to rediscover who they are, right? And so Iqbal has his Persian poem where he says that, you know, the, the age of Abu Lahab produced the age of the Prophet, right? And so because of the, the jahili or the ignorance and the uh, kind of depravity and the, and, the, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the low values that the pre-Islamic Arabs had, that allowed for the rise of the, person, the, the personality of the exalted Prophet and his companions, right? And so he says, 
طوفان مغرب نے مسلمان کو مسلمان کر دیا the storm of the west has made muslims muslims right and so he kind of sees this as an excellent opportunity to add to the scaffolding of islam but the idea of the khudi or the selfhood is really important um for iqbal and he sees this um even in poetry right so one one in rumi has this famous persian ghazal where he says ke khudra namidana right that i don't know who myself is and and the journey of the sawuf right the journey of sufism is this journey of selfhood right and so iqbal has read you know iqbal is just a, a, a reading of, of of so many different civilizations and especially in muslim civilization right and we'll see this inshallah and in, you know in the part 2 of our of our uh, of our, uh, of, our, of, our of our of our series um you know kashmiri poets iranian poets turkish poets arab poets black poets you know hindu poets and he's just someone who is just a voracious reader and he interlaces all of those themes and motifs within his poetry namely for the reconstruction of the muslim selfhood and um and this is his famous line where he says you know khudi ko kar buland itna ke har taqdeer se pehle khuda bande se khud pooche bata tere raza kya hai right that iqbal says that raise your selfhood raise your individual personality so high that allah himself should ask you that oh my slave tell me what do you want and i will will it right and um reflecting on the verse of the quran on the second page of surah ra'd where allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says inna allaha la yughayyiru ma bi qawmin hatta yughayyiru ma bi anfusihim that allah will not rectify the condition of a people until they rectify the condition of themselves you guys all saw in 60 years what happened to the mughal empire that is not you know that is not an accident that is there's clearly a divine hand going on there right for you to lose the entire you know for you to lose five countries in 60 years right for the something was clearly wrong something was amiss with muslims in the subcontinent for allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow that to happen right something was clearly um, fundamentally and inherently wrong and there needed to be a reckoning right and as i said to azzu man tasha wa tudhillu man tasha right that allah kind of honors whom, whom he wills and disgraces whomsoever he wills right ba khuda dar par da goyam ba tu goyam ashkar ya rasulullah bin hatu paida iman right and um there's so many different kinds of these of these of these couplets um present in iqbal's persian poetry that really just narrate the pain and also the necessity to kind of rise right uh, you know he says ay um rahmada ay pira haram iqbal ra rahmada ay pira haram iqbal ra ke dar astanish u har roz khuda wand digar right that oh oh peer of the kaaba oh oh custodian of the kaaba oh sheikh of the kaaba do not allow iqbal to enter into the sanctuary because he has new idols up his sleeves every single day um and iqbal is the you know is is a, is a kind of metaphor for the muslim ummah because the muslim ummah has no longer um um turned back to the quran and the prophet as well as as well as their civilizational legacy right and um this is important because remember islam cannot be understood without your own context but with, without also your parents generation your grandparents generation you have to think of islam as a you know as different layers right it's you know it's a ladder up to the prophet alayhi salatu wasalam and you can't skip a generation when you um recourse back to the holy prophet alayhi salatu wasalam but also um uh, you know and so the idea of khudi or selfhood was that um thinking about the holy prophet alayhi salatu wasalam as the greatest personality to enter into this world right one time he was giving a lecture um, i believe in either madras or hyderabad in british india in the late 1920s right so about 20 years before partition and uh, one of these european mustashriqin or orientalists asked him that how do you how do you scientifically or how do you psych psychologically or cognitively explain the phenomenon of wahi of revelation right when allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that um you know oha right what is what is wahi what is iha right how, how do you explain revelation pouring in pouring into someone of being divinely inspired right so ikhbal you know and really is one of his most beautiful answers is that you know when i put my pen to paper i don't even understand the metaphysical forces that 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 push me to write my poetry how can i explain what goes on with the holy prophet and he is a prophet mai to sirf ek shayar hu right wo to ek paigambar hai nabi hai right and um that was that was really um important and um for iqbal so the prophet being the most central personality 
um, and 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 um, uh, you know, and he you know he he cites this 16th century Mughal Sufi where he says um, that the Prophet of Arabia والسلام, ascended the seven heavens, right, i.e. Mi'raj, and he came back. He says, by Allah, if I had ascended the seven heavens, I would have never returned. What does that mean? That because remember, the Prophet is a prophet. You know, to escape this world to escape to a place where there's no time and place. La zamana wa la makana. Yani fihima. Right? There's no place, there's no time. But the Prophet goes to the afterlife. He goes into Barzakh. He goes into Malakut, into these different worlds. And he sees people being punished, right, for sins like zina and interest. How is that happening if Qiyamah hasn't taken place yet? Right? If Qiyamah hasn't taken place, why are these people being punished in Jahannam? How is he seeing Ibrahim salam in paradise with, with, the, you know, with the kids of the polytheists as the hadith comes in Bukhari? Um, that's because their time and place do, do not exist, right? The idea of past, present, and future, those concepts do not exist in any measure. Those are all confines of this world. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he exists beyond time, right? The, you know, the very first lines of Imam Tahawi's uh, creed, right? In Allah wahidun na sharika lahu wala shay'a mithluhu wala shay'a yu'ajizuhu wala ilaha ghayru qadimun bila ibtida in daimun bila intihai in la yafna wala yabid wala yakunu illa ma yurid la tablughu al-awham wala tudrikuhu al-afham wala takunu illa ma yurid Right, and, Imam, and, and this becomes theology for Ahlu Sunnah wal Jama'ah but specifically for the Hanafi Maturidis Right, the idea that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exists not only beyond time but beyond our own cognition Right, so for the idea being that, um, you know, if Allah created us, then who created Allah? But the idea of creation um, necessitates, and time itself is a creation, right? And it's one of the most um, path-breaking or intellectually groundbreaking ahadith or sayings of the Holy Prophet um, is the last hadith of Abu Dawood, and it was the last hadith that we did um, in Alam course after, you know, a long seven years. But um, where the Prophet, والسلام, says, لا تصب الدهر. Do not curse time. فإني أنا الدهر. Because Allah Himself is time, right? And so, um, you know, we can we can unpack that later in the the, the the philosophical implications and undertones of that statement, and how Abdul Qadir Jilani and Bayezid Bistami and Imam Ghazali and Shah Waliullah, all of these people kind of understand the hadith as as a way of understanding time. Because remember, for Islam, time is not this kind of linear way of past, present, and future. It's a more cyclical way of understanding time. Right, and you know, and we understand, especially for the West, that every age, the idea of progress, right, that the age is supposed to get better. As Muslims, we don't believe that, right, because every age beyond the Holy Prophet's time is objectively worse, right, because we're more distant from the time of the Prophet. What do the Prophets say? Qarani, thumma yalunahum, thumma yalunahum. The best of my generation, the, the the best era is my generation, and the generation after them, and then the generation after them. So the Prophet only gave glad times to three generations, right? So the idea being that time, um, uh, but also in the way that we kind of recourse to time itself is something that, you know, that, you know, that, that can be discussed. I'm going to end um, with um, Iqbal's poem when he went to Cordoba. Remember I told you guys he was the first Muslim to pray inside Cordoba as, you know, as far as the historical record goes, this is as far as my research goes, he goes and prays in 1930. And um, no Muslim had prayed in the mosque of Cordoba since they were exiled in 1492, right? So almost 500 years later, the first Muslim to go and pray is Muhammad Iqbal, right? And um, which itself says something about his personality for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to choose him. But um, he, he kind of stands inside the masjid and he starts weeping, right? Um, as Cordoba being this metaphor, this metonym of the lost civilization of Muslims. You know, and he has, and, and, and he writes a ghazal. Um, and uh, we don't have the time to talk about ghazals today, but, um, and he writes his ghazal. But anyways, he says that, he starts to talk about time, right? And he says that Cordoba, meaning the civilization of Muslim Cordoba was beyond time, that, you know, how can we even capture you, that you live beyond time? And the civilization of Islam, you know, time cannot understand it. Um, and, and, you know, we can still reclaim it because just because it was in the past doesn't mean it can't be in the future because time is arbitrary, right? And then he says, and he starts to have this, um, you know, just almost divine inspiration of the idea of ish or love. And he says,
of wujud, ishq sarapad, ram just mein nahi rakhto bud. So he says that love, you know, is the heart of the, you know, is the heart of the prophet. Love is the breath of Jibreel, right? And so love is not just something this kind of capitalist, carnal, Coachella way of understanding, you know, just basic affection, but it's something that's much more um, holistic and much more civilizational, um, an idea that um, in which rationality cannot obtain it. It's something that kind of transcends rationality. It's something that your soul feels. And this is what's really meant by love, right? Um, uh, you know, what does he say? Ba Mustafa Barisan Khishaw Kedi Hama Ust Agar Una Rasidi Tamam Bula Habis that make yourself reach the Prophet for all of the deen is contained in him. If you don't reach the Prophet, everything else is Abu Laha. Right? And then um, in in this last couple that I'm gonna read to you. But anyways, he's weeping in front of and you know, for those people who have been to Cordoba. Um, when I was there a couple of years ago, I mean it's really an emotional experience. There's a courtyard obviously all of it is still preserved and the whole city itself is kind of constructed around the the, the Jami Masjid of Cordoba and I would say it's pretty well preserved. I mean, they do a better job of preserving Saudi Arabia, it does anyway. But anyways, he says, Ey harame Qurtuba, O sanctuary of Cordoba, you know, love underscores your entire existence, but love here mean, means the central impulse of Muslims, right? And, you know, in another poem that he has is Bangi Dara and his caravan belt, he talks about when the Muslims go and conquer, Pal you know, when the Muslims go and take Syria and Palestine um, in the Battle of Yarmouk. And he, and he talks about how this young companion of the Prophet goes up to the commander, Abu Ubaidah bin Jarrah, right? And he says, no jawan kalam. That he comes and he speaks to the commander of the army. And he says, Abu Ubaidah, that Abu Ubaidah, give me permission to, to, to kind of partake in this battle. That, um, that my goblet of patience has become overfilled. Again, in recalling the, the, the classical Persian literary tropes, uh, that that I'm becoming um, kind of anxious by the fact that the Prophet has left us. That one second to live without the Prophet is impermissible. That now I'm going to go meet the Prophet. And if, oh, Abu Ubaidah, remember, he's one of the Ashara Mubashar, one of the ten people uh, promised paradise. But the Prophet said, Yeah, Abu Ubaidah, Anta Aminu Hadihil Ummah. Imam Bukhari brings his hadith in Babu Manaqib al Sahaba in the end of the first volume that, oh, Abu Ubaidah, you, you are the trustworthy one of the Ummah. Right? And that the Prophet himself is al Amin al Nasadiq. He himself is the trustworthy one. And he only gave that title to Abu Ubaidah, the, the, the Sahabi who takes Syria and Palestine, Lebanon and Jordan, and brings it under the fold of Islam. And, uh, and then Abu Ubaidah hears this, you know, uh, the, the commander of this army, Abu Ubaidah, listens to this and he starts to weep. And he says, Bola Amire Fuj Kevo no Javan He tu ke ish ke pirum petere ish ke vajib he ihtaram that you're such a you know you're such a young man that it's wad that it's necessary for you know for elders to to, to honor you and to you know and to and, and to respect you. And then he says this is all at Bal Puri Kare Khudai Muhammad Teri Murad Kitna Bulan Teri Muhabbat Kahe Makam may the you know may the Lord of Muhammad fulfill your ambition, your aspiration. How high is your station? Uh, that when you reach the, the, the sanctuary of the Holy Prophet, that convey my salams to him, right? This is Abu Ubaidah, right? His, his friend, that when you reach the, the station of the Holy Prophet in Barzakh, then convey, convey my salam to him. And, 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 and tell the Prophet, right? That um, the Lord of Majesty, the Lord of Majesty has shown such favors upon us, meaning Muslims. That all of the promises the Holy Prophet made to us, they have become true. They have proven to be true, right? And you know, the Prophet said, you will take Turkey, you will take Palestine, you will take Egypt, you know, you will be inheritors of this civilization, etc., etc., no Prabhupada you know, is telling his prophet that all of the, pro all of the promises that Allah had made to us have become true. And this, 
um, you know, is supposed to be a representation of what selfhood looked like, right? So kind of centered around the personality of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. But um, we've run out of time and we'll stop there. Inshallah, we'll pick it up next week. And I want to talk uh, much more about his Persian and especially his philosophy, um, you know, his magnum opus, the reconstruction of religious thought in Islam. Um, it's not studied enough, unfortunately, um, other than a few professors at Lums um, really know what he's talking about. Um, Iqbal there and the Iqbalian project and what does that mean? Um, and I know that the, the, the lecture series titled today was the relevance of Allah Iqbal today. But um, as I said, we can't understand it, Iqbal or even that relevance unless we understand the background, the history, who himself, who he was, etc. But yeah. Jazakallah khair. Sorry, I can't, I think you're on mute. Sorry, <laughs> I forgot to unmute. But Jazakallah Khair, Ustad Salad, that was like a super informative um, presentation. And given like the, just the audience response too, I think this is a topic that's um, very like relevant in today's time. And I think also just um, for the Muslim population today, especially like in the West, and as we want to kind of un uncover our own history, um, learning about Alam Iqbal is just, I think, so relevant and so poignant right now. Yeah, so yeah. yeah. Um, we did have some questions from the audience, so I, before we end, I'd like to just try to cover some of those if we can. Um, one question that we had from one of our participants was, uh, how did the ulama in India view Alam Iqbal, and did he ever criticize the ulama or the Mughals? That's a, that's a great question. Um, thank you. So, so the ulama kind of had a, a complicated relationship. Um, some ulama, you know, he was really close to. Some, he, you know, he was not. Um, he had he had a particularly nasty exchange um, over the issue of a separate homeland for Muslims. And so, one of the leading Deobandi scholars, one of Hussein Ahmed Madani, um, you know, for those who are aware of kind of intellectual Islamic history in the subcontinent. Um, they had an exchange in one of these Muslim newspapers about whether or not Muslims are of the same ethnicity as Hindus. And so Iqbal, you know, thought that their allegiances lied much more broadly. So to uh, Persian Muslims, to black Muslims, to Arab Muslims, to Turkic Muslims, you know, to Malaysian Muslims, that was their brotherhood. Um, you know, nationality it was not really based on linguistic ties. It was based on, you know, theology, and which is why India is the biggest proof of that, in which you had so many different ethnicities come in and become, you know, part of this really vibrant culture. So, um, you know, there's this debate, you know, and he says in two lines, he's critiquing one of Hussein Madani, who kind of was anti-partition. Um, he wanted India to be, he, he disagreed vehemently about Pakistan. He said that Pakistan, there's no need for Pakistan to be made. We are all Indian, etc. And Iqbal was kind of like, you know, first of all, what does it even mean to be Indian? Are we Indian first? Are we Muslim first? So he says, Ajam Hanuz Nadana Dramuzidin Varna Zadeoban Hussein Ahmad Inchebul Ajabis, that you know non non Arabs are still ignorant to the secrets of their religion. Otherwise, Hussein Ahmad Madani from Deoban, how strange is he? Surud Bar Sarai Mimbar Kemilat as Vatanas, Chebe Khabar Zamakam in Muhammad Arabis, that uh, you know, does he not know the station of the holy Arab Prophet alayhi salatu was salam? Uh, you know, he sings on the, you know, he sings on the member that Muslims have a territorial homeland. They can be confined to a physical territory. You know, and then he says, Bilal as Hab Suhaib as Rum, Salman as far as Bu, Lahab as Makkai, Chaybul Ajabis, that, you know, Bilal radiallahu anhu was black, Salman was Persian, and Suhaib was Greek. And Abu Lahab, even though he was an Arab and an uncle of the Holy Prophet, you know, he died in Mecca, and everyone knows it, he'll go to Jahannam, right? The Batyada Abu Lahab. And, uh, and uh, and then he says Bamus, and then he says that line that I said to you earlier, right? The Bamustafa Barisan Khishrak Hadi Hamaus that make yourself reach the Prophet. But now I would say ulama are universally um, um, they see Iqbal as the greatest poet, the greatest Muslim poet of the 20th century. The only poet, the only Muslim poet I think who compares is the Palestinian poet Mahmoud Darwish. But Mahmoud Darwish didn't really didn't really refer to Islam. Um, other than in some parts, and he was more about Palestine, which is obviously really critical. But uh, you know, the, he was. I would say, in terms of just poetry and style, Mahmoud Darwish is the only person who really compares to Iqbal. But in terms of Islam, nobody compares to Iqbal. And um, 
you know, the way that Iqbal is celebrated, I mean, for the Pakistanis and the Indians to know how much he is revered and loved and adored. And um, so now I would say there's a general acceptance. When I was in Madrasa, we even had some teachers who quoted him in class. And I went to a Deobandi Madrasa. So um, I would say uh, that was just a more personal thing. But yeah, I hope, I hope that answers the question. Uh, and also, did he criticize the ulama? He did. Yes, he did have an issue. Um, he, 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 he believed that the ulama were not did not challenge British hegemony, and he took deep issue with that. So for example, um, he has this really self-reflective uh, Persian quatrain um, where he says, Tharang uh, said bast az Kaaba that the, that the Europeans came and took over Muslim sanctuaries. Sada az khanqaha raf la ghayr, that he went to the Sufis. The, the Sufis said, "What's there's nothing wrong with these Europeans. I mean, they're just like us. What's, you know, there's nothing different about them. And he says, he khayat pishay mullah baaz kuftam. And then he says, I went to the ulama to tell them the news of this tragedy. Look, look, look what's going on with Muslims. And he says, that all the Mulana did was just raise his hand. And he said, may Allah let the European die on Iman. But I he didn't do anything. But yeah, sorry, kind of no, 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 the, tangential. And I, I guess like piggy, piggybacking off that, um, was, there was another question. If, if, uh, did, did he have any um, traditional Islamic training himself? Yeah, uh, re really good question. So he, other than, uh, other than the, the, the maktab education, which is, um, for those people who don't know, it's just kind of elementary education. It's equivalent of, an, you know, uh, what we have in America is, uh, you know, elementary school or primary school education. And, um, but, but I would say the difference is the maktab in like the early 20th century Muslim world from, you know, West Africa to India, uh, you know, was much more intellectually sophisticated than what we have today, where, you know, when you were, you know, a 10 year old, uh, you know, Muslim kid from, from Senegal in 1900 or, or Lahore, you know, knew more than most Muslim adults today. So it's a, so he, typically he didn't have, um, he didn't really go to a mother said beyond, you know, the age of five to 10. Um, and that too was just for kids. But I said the education there was very different. I mean, he picked up Persian and Arabic grammar from the age of five to 10, which is what every kind of Muslim did in South Asia then was to learn Persian, Arabic and Urdu by the, by the age of 12 or 13. So basically their basic training was what would be like degree, essentially. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, I, you know, you don't have iPhones. Uh, uh, child education can be much, you know, can be very, very yeah. qualitatively different. Um, I know you also spoke about, you know, um, given that he had written so much Persian poetry, um, he, you know, the reasons why maybe he, he isn't as well known there of the nationalistic reasons. Would those same reasons apply also like in the Arab world is, or is he, or is he known in the Arab world as well? So, so that's, that's, that's a really good question. I mean, as I said, because he, he wrote in Persian and Arabs, uh, you know, they can be a little bit nationalist about Arabic <laughs> and unless it's French, they're always down to read French, but if it's not, <laughs> you know, like in, when I was in Beirut, I heard, it was like, why am I hearing French here? But, um, and uh, so, but in some intellectual spaces, you will read Iqbal. So for example, um, the famous novelist of the Muslim Brotherhood of Egypt um, took deep inspiration from Iqbal. Um, there were certain Syrian scholars who were part of the Islamist movement um, had read Iqbal in translation, uh, more his philosophical ideas and his poetry, because, you know, you know as, you, as I'm sure you guys are aware, um, you know, translation, you know, is always a very thorny, thorny project. Um, he's starting to be read a lot in Turkey right now. He was translated in Turkish in the 80s, and Erdogan has really started to patronize the thought of Iqbal within Turkey today. Um, Iran, um, who's Ayatollah Khomeini, um, obviously really started to patronize him. The Shahs of Iran before him, not really, because they were more secular, but yeah. Okay. Um, and then did he have any other, like, Sufi influences, or was he part of a tariqa? So I'm, I'm not sure if he was part of a tariqa. You can kind of say he was part of all tariqas because he, um, it's really interesting. We'll talk about this in our, in our part two, but in his magnum opus, Reconstruction of Religious Thought, he's trying to understand the sawwuf in a scientific lens. So what does it mean when Mulana Rumi or, uh, you know, uh, the Naqshbandi or the, or the Qadri or the Chishti saints are talking in ecstasy of Allah? How do you scientifically and philosophically explain that? Right, and so that's what's really phenomenal. So he's much more interested in the intellectual enterprise, um, and because Sufism is embedded in the everyday language of South Asian Muslims, he wants to understand that on um, a scientific level. Okay, 
Um, and then um, one last question that we had, do you have any sources um, in terms of books or maybe even like videos um, or lectures or anything that, that you would say that you would recommend if people wanted to read? I mean, inshallah, we're going to have a part two as well. Um, yeah. But, you know, if people wanted to read anything on their own, if there's any resources out there. Yeah, let me, um, let me, let me, let me show you guys. Uh, so, 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 the, so, the, so the most comprehensive book on Iqbal was written by this German professor. Her name was Anne-Mary Schimmel. She was a professor of Near, Near Eastern Languages and Civilizations at Harvard for two decades. And she is the Iqbal scholar. She wrote a book called Gabriel's Wing. And um, let me go ahead and share that with you guys. Uh, and uh, she's this really wonderful old, she passed away, but um, this is a kind of three, 400 text on Iqbal. And um, you can kind of uh, get the sense of, of her right here. Uh, yeah, so Gabriel, so I would say this is, this is the kind of most holistic book. Because unfortunately, because remember, in order to study Iqbal, you have to know Persian, you have to know Urdu, and you have to know English, you know, in a really dense philosophical way. So it's really tough to find a holistic and a comprehensive work on Iqbal because nobody seems to check all of those boxes. Because, the, you know, um, but Shimil, Shimil does, and she knows Persian, she knows Urdu, so she's translating his poetry, but she's also a German philosopher too, so she's understanding Iqbal's German ideas and translating those ideas and, and kind of um, making it accessible for us. I would say this is the most, um, and, and then a kind of second really good book is um, uh, The Political Philosophy of Iqbal. It's written by this Sikh guy, this Punjabi Sikh guy who um, got his PhD from Oxford and his dissertation was on Iqbal. And um, he's a professor now at University of North Carolina. And this is the second, uh, I would say, uh, most comprehensive book on Iqbal. But yeah. I hope, I don't know. Um, and then if you guys, and then, in, you know, in terms of his Urdu poetry, I would say, um, you know, this this website right here, I can also send it, um, it's called the Alama Iqbal Urdu Blogspot. Yeah, this website right here, I can go ahead and paste it. Um, the English translation is a little bit archaic in the sense that um, it's, uh, um, I'll go ahead and share this here. And in in that they use words like thou and thy, etc. So um, other than that, yeah, I'll go ahead and send that here. Okay, I think we are just about out of time. But um, Jazakallah Khair again, Ustad Salah, that was really like just super informative. I think we yeah. just like, like a drop in the bucket, it seems. So, uh, yeah, um, I apologize for talking fast. It's just Iqbal kind of does that to you where it's like, there's so much to talk about and you're just like, how do I discuss all this stuff? So I apologize for, for the kind of quick speaking. No, I think, I think it just goes to show that like really the audience was really intrigued to hear what you had to say about him. So alhamdulillah, I think inshallah, if we can, you know, schedule another session, um, it, would be, it would be great inshallah. Yeah, th thank you guys again so much for having me. I'm really humbled and honored to be here and uh, um, may Allah help us do justice to the thought of Iqbal and and help us to honor his message, inshallah. Amen, inshallah, inshallah. So, inshallah, we will end the program here. Um, for those of you guys who are watching, um, please follow us on Facebook or um, sign on to our mailing list from sakinainstitute.org um, so that way you can stay up to date on to future programs and inshallah the part two of this session as well. So, jazakallah khair, everyone, assalamu alaikum.